from uh, the Presidential Library Group has been working with each other for quite a few years now and uh, we often get together and run programs during the summer. So uh, what you've done, Therese, over at Internet2 has been really special in allowing us the opportunity uh, to be able to coalesce all of our resources and provide them to teachers nationally. Uh, during these troubling times. So um, welcome, we're happy you're here. My name is Mira Cohen. I'm the Director of Education at the Ronald Reagan Presidential Library and Museum. And I'll be uh, passing this over to others in the group to introduce their, themselves. We're gonna do this in a little bit of a chronological fashion uh, throughout the week. And we hope uh, that as we do so, begin to really see and think about and ask questions about a lot of the themes that we'll be sharing. So first off, uh, Elizabeth, can you please go ahead and introduce yourself? Hi, everybody. My name is Elizabeth Dinchel, and I am an archivist and an education specialist at the Hoover Presidential Library and Museum, located in West Branch, Iowa. I see some familiar names on there, so it's good to see everybody. Wonderful. And Jeff. Hi, everybody. I'm Jeff Urban. I'm the Education Director at the Roosevelt Presidential Library um, in Hyde Park, New York, located about an hour and a half north of New York City. Delighted to be here and um, hope that you'll all find the next uh, three days uh, fun and informative. Terrific. Mark. Hey, everybody. I'm Mark Adams, the Education Director at the Truman Library and Museum in Independence, Missouri, just east of Kansas City. Very excited to be here uh, with my colleagues and looking forward to the next three days. Wonderful. Kathleen. Hi, I'm Kathleen Pate. I am the education specialist at the Clinton Presidential Library, which is located in Little Rock, Arkansas. But I am coming to you for the next three days from Littleton, Colorado. So excited to be here and I'm glad the power of the, the World Wide Web allows us to be together. Fantastic. So to get us started off on our work over the next three days on presidential campaigns, uh, we're going to take a look at some campaign buttons in just a minute. And the question I'm going to ask you to answer is, which do you like the best and why? Which do you like the best and why? So give me a second and here they are. Which she'll like the best and why? And which one I like best. <laughs> Thank you, Jeff. All right, so let, we're looking for responses in the chat. Okay, I'm just wild about Harry. Also, who but Hoover. All right, now I've got three votes for Wild About Harry. What do you all like the most about I'm Just Wild About Harry? Why does that grab you? Oh, well, now we're getting some different votes. Roosevelt, someone likes, uh, Leslie likes Reagan's smile. Hmm. Finally got a Clinton vote. <laughs> Not getting any for Carter, are we, Kathleen? No, and I'm telling you, my husband says green never wins. Green never wins. That you, If you're running a campaign, you always want your button to be red, white, and blue. Yeah. Oh, Mondo face. That is a problem. I find it. Most of them are using red, white, and blue. I see um, some are just going with the blue and the white. Yeah, but never green. No, not green, not green. Um, yeah, Roosevelt. Roosevelt. What do you like about Roosevelt? Not you, Jeff. Oh. <laughs> Which do you think is the most effective? Which do you think is the most effective? You can just put your answers in the chat box. Which is the most effective button? Hmm. 
Oh, that's funny. FDRs looks like a life-saving inner tube. Oh, kind of does. What's wrong with that? He was a lifesaver. <laughs> Hoover disagrees. <laughs> yeah, we didn't, do, we didn't get a lot of who but Hoover. Yeah, some interesting slogans. All right, so that's just a little warm-up activity. Uh, with that, I'm going to pass the baton over to Elizabeth. We're talking today about the theme of presidential campaign personalities. Personalities. How do these personalities help create a winning campaign? So Elizabeth, uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about Hoover? Sure, hello everybody. So I've got Hoover up there. You can see one of his campaign posters, Make Hoover President. So what comes to mind when I mention Herbert Hoover? Give me some answers in the chat box because I want to see what you guys have to say about it. Ah, oh, there we go. I lost my chat for a second. A chicken in every pot, business-like, Hoovervilles, uh, Secretary of Agriculture, he was not, stock market crash. Yeah, these are the things that are going to come up, and we see this a lot in presidential history. Um, sometimes we see like George Washington, the cherry tree story, um, and now even with like the rise of Hamilton coming out, we're dealing with a lot of kind of urban lore in the classroom. So what are some ways that we can overcome that so that we can actually share these historic narratives in a really meaningful and honest way? We have to deconstruct the narrative that our students know. So when we say Hoover, I don't want you guys to think about Hoovervilles. I mean, clearly he got elected at some point and people liked him a lot, right? So we're gonna look at it that way. This is a button from our collection. It says draft Hoover. And a lot of our students are like, draft him into the military? No, that's not what it means. Hoover was approached by both parties to run for president. How does this happen? Like you wouldn't approach a modern day president from both parties. He literally had never run for office before this. Um, he was drafted into a presidential run. During this time um, in presidential history, it was kind of ungentlemanly like to throw your name in the ring. So you waited to be recruited or drafted into the campaigns. Um, and in fact, the Hoover Curtis campaign was controlled, financed, and organized by the Republican Party, not Hoover. Uh, Hoover actually said he did not want a campaign for himself. So how does Hoover become this really popular figure that gets him elected into office? Well, first of all, he has this great rags to riches story, which is wonderful campaign pitch. He was born in rural West, West Branch, Iowa in 1874. His father was a blacksmith and his mother, Hulda, was a leader in their Quaker church. His father died when he was six and his mother died three years later, leaving him and his siblings orphans. The Hoover children were sent to Portland to live with their family. And despite his tragic upbringing, he went on to be part of the first class at Stanford University to graduate. He became a successful mining engineer and became a millionaire before he was 30. So he's like this perfect American dream story, right? So this is what's going out to the campaigns uh, in the campaign literature. And there's three different ways and talking points that they sell his personality to the American public. He's known as the great engineer, the great humanitarian, and the master of emergencies. His many of accomplishments in public service led to the press calling him the most popular man on the, in the world. He was on the cover of Time Magazine before he was president. He appears in newsreels, newspapers, and government publications. He's literally a household name. Um, he, public was really familiar with his life as an engineer. He was appointed uh, to the head of the Food Administration by Woodrow Wilson to help manage food during World War I. Um, his job was to get ahead of food shortages. Hoover became a household name with his slogans like Meatless Mondays and Wheatless Wednesdays. And he became known for Hooverizing, which literally meant like getting excess waste out of your house. So people would Hooverize to make sure that the troops had food and that there was food in other parts of the world. The 1920s brought major change to American life. 
Hoover was there to regulate and oversee all of this new technology as the U.S. Secretary of Commerce. He was appointed by Harding and served through Harding and Coolidge all the way until he became the president. He was even on the first television broadcast in 1927. Americans equated this te these technological advances and advances in safety with motor vehicles and air travel with Hoover. Because of his great success as an engineer and as a great administrator, people thought that he would run the government with the efficiency of an engineer. At the start of World War I, many Americans were stranded in Europe. Hoover put up his vast personal fortune to get Americans out of Europe and back to the United States. He was almost paid back every penny that he invested into the rescue efforts. Um, and also during World War I, the country of Belgium was cut off because of blockades and the citizens were starving. Hoover negotiated agreements between governments and corporations to donate food and get it past the Belgium blockade to feed people. He also got food to Russia during their huge famine that was occurring at about the same time. Hoover would go on to organize food relief for the rest of his life. And even now, he's more so known for being the great humanitarian than anything else. The Master of Emergencies is a great story. The Mississippi River flooded in 1927. Up until that date, it was one of the worst natural disasters the United States had ever seen. Many people lost their homes and businesses and the relief efforts weren't going well. Hoover organized with the Red Cross and local leaders to get the situation under control. Afterwards, they released almost what was like a propaganda film called The Master of Emergencies. And there was all these reports that people wept when they saw it and it was so moving and so emotional that they just fell in love with Hoover. And this happened in newsreels all across the United States. And then there's like these interviews that come out afterwards and Hoover really appeals to these small government um, voters when he says, I suppose I could have called in the army, but what was the use? All I had to do was call in Main Street itself. And he really hit home with that, that it's just the might of Main Street that really makes America. And I've got up there some of the, the campaign flyers that came out um, with the master of emergencies on it, because this was the most recent thing in American memory when this campaign starts, starts up, is people remember him going in to where the Mississippi flood was the worst and fixing it without the government. So Hoover's popularity and the Republican strategies that we'll talk about over the next couple of days led to Hoover winning in the largest landslide in history, largest presidential election landslide in history. But this is not where his campaign story ends. He's also going to lose by the largest landslide in history. 1932 Hoover was not the same as 1928 Hoover. His popularity really plummeted with the Great Depression, and there was a lot of other political hiccups, um, such as calling in federal troops on peaceful protesters who were veterans in Washington, D.C. Um, Lou Hoover publicly desegregated the White House, which went against their planks in the Republican Party to kind of keep the status quo on racial relations. Um, and we'll talk about that in the future. But the 1928 campaign is the only political campaign that Hoover ever won in his lifetime because he never ran before that and he loses the election after that. And he will never run for office again. But he does become a trusted advisor to future presidents and future administrations and leads some different efforts on reorganizing the executive branch. So he has this really big fall from grace. Um, 1932 um, is really difficult. And Jeff is gonna talk a little bit about FDR, but even at the national conventions in 32, they didn't even hang banners for Hoover uh, at the convention, which was different than usual. So I'm gonna hand it off to Jeff so he can talk about FDR, uh, which is different than than Hoover, right, Jeff? Absolutely, but I, I do want to thank you for that. You know, poor poor President Hoover gets saddled with the blame for the um, for the uh, the Great Depression, and you know, really, Hoover was kind of born here and worked his way up to there, and Roosevelt was kind of born here and worked his way up. 
So, um, you know, being a self-made man the way he was, you know, President Hoover really was, um, was a fantastic guy. And, uh, and it is kind of unfair that he got saddled uh, with blame for the Great Depression. Um, but that's exactly what happened. Now, my president is the only president ever elected four times in 1932, 36, 40, and 44. And over the next uh, two or three days, we'll talk a little bit about um, you know, those, uh, those elections and such. And we're here to talk about uh, celebrity character charisma. Um, pretty much any Democrat could have beaten um, President Hoover in 1932. People had just really um, gotten fed up with the, the economic situation and um, you know, the country was really, really uh, in dire straits. So when uh, President Roosevelt goes to the Democratic Convention in 32 uh, to try to get the, uh, the nomination, the, the convention is deadlocked on the first uh, round of, of voting, the first couple of rounds of voting. And um, there was a, a group of folks that supported the, the city Democrats, um, which were uh, headed by, um, uh, by the former uh, governor uh, of, of New York, um, Al Smith. And then there were also the um, sort of the country Democrats that were sort of being headed up by um, uh, Cactus Jack Garner uh, from Texas. And Roosevelt, coming up into the uh, into the uh, 1932 election, saw this division in the in the Democratic Party, and he courted both sides of uh, of those uh, those Democrats, the city Democrats, and the country Democrats. And this begins to sort of uh, sow a seed that you know that Roosevelt is kind of you know, devious. Um, and you could look at it as if he was devious, or you could look at it as if he was being really smart, because what he did was he cultivated alliances in both divisions uh, of the Democratic Party. So when they get to the, uh, to the convention, um, what he does is he asks Garner to throw his support to him. Garner does that. He puts Garner on uh, the, for the vice presidential spot, and Roosevelt um, gets the, uh, the nomination. Garner gives Roosevelt um, a piece of advice. He says, all we have to do to win this election is stay alive until election day. And um, that's darn good advice. Uh, and it almost uh, was not advice that Roosevelt took. Uh, President Roosevelt, um, there was an assassination attempt against him in um, February of 1933. Uh, so remember back in those days, you were elected in November and then you took office in March. So you had a six month period where um, folks had basically voted Hoover out of office and you know, we're kind of tied up and fed up with him. And Roosevelt had been elected, but he had no power or ability to do anything. So he goes to, um, to uh, Miami, Florida for a vacation to rest up before he takes over the power uh, of the government. And while he's in Miami, he gives a, an impromptu speech uh, at a park. And just as he slides back down to the car, uh, a guy by the name of um, Giuseppe Zangaran uh, steps up steps up on a park bench and opens fire at the president. Now the president had slipped back into the car so he was safe, but Zangaran did hit um, uh, the mayor of Chicago, uh, a gentleman by the name of Shermack. Now I want to point out that the students always say, wow, he was in Miami and he hit the mayor of Chicago. The mayor of Chicago happened to be in Miami. It wasn't that great of a shot. Nonetheless, uh, Roosevelt is unscathed and this creates this aura around him. That, that God somehow spared him from this assassination and that this guy really was somebody who had sort of the hand of, of, uh, of God up upon him. So that was the 32 election. 36 is basically a referendum uh, on the New Deal and he runs against uh, Alf Landon there. Um, 1940 is a campaign uh, as to uh, uh, two major topics. Number one is war is on the horizon. What are we gonna do about that? And number two is, should a president run for a uh, third term, right? Nobody had ever really done that before. Teddy Roosevelt had done it uh, with the Bull Moose Party, but only garnered like 23% of the vote. So if two terms was good enough for George Washington, what makes Franklin Roosevelt think he needs uh, a third term? And two of the things that he was concerned about were, uh, number one, his New Deal legacy, right? The, programs of the New Deal had become challenged in the Supreme Court, and so um, he was beginning to lose some, some support for those, and the, the court was, was overturning some of those, like the National Recovery Administration and the Agricultural um, Adjustment Act, the original Agricultural Adjustment Act. The other thing he was worried about was what was going on in Europe. 
One of the cool things of history is that Adolf Hitler and Franklin Roosevelt come to power within 12 weeks of each other, and they die within less than 12 weeks of each other. So you have good and evil on the world stage at precisely the same time. And Roosevelt had been the um, uh, Assistant Secretary of the Navy during the First World War, so he saw the signs and symptoms of a Second World War beginning to grow. Roosevelt had two great uh, dress rehearsals for the presidency. Number one, he was the governor of the state of New York during the first four years of the Great Depression, um, which gave him a, an opportunity to try out many of these programs that we know to become uh, the New Deal. And uh, the other one was that he was Assistant Secretary of the Navy during the First World War, so he knew how to get men and materials and supplies and ships and planes and all those things across an ocean uh, to fight a world war, which comes in very handy when he becomes the commander in chief. Then the fourth election, um, the big issues there were, what's the post-World War uh, world gonna look like? You know, what's the peace going to look like? And is Roosevelt um, too sick to, uh, to run for that? And of course, he runs against Thomas Dewey, who later becomes famous by having his butt kicked by Harry Truman, but Roosevelt kicked um, uh, Tom Dewey's butt first uh, in the 1944 um, election. Now, uh, Roosevelt was a very popular governor in New York State, and New York State was the largest state in the Union uh, at that time. Um, and um, he gives a speech at the convention, uh, in his acceptance, and he says, I pledge you, I pledge myself to a new deal for the American people. And I've got a, a copy of that speech here. And what you'll notice is that this pledge of a new deal comes in the second to last paragraph of an 18-page speech. So basically what happened was uh, the press picked up this idea of, oh, a new deal. He's calling it the New Deal. Roosevelt himself never called the New Deal the New Deal until after it became sort of the moniker that was instilled um, by the press. So a little, a little uh, known fact uh, there. Um, Roosevelt was very confident in uh, his abilities. He um, had had this, this uh, you know, limited success in New York uh, State first. Uh, trying out programs like the Civilian Conservation Corps, the Tennessee Valley Authority, you know, which later becomes Tennessee Valley Authority, were tried out in small um, places here uh, at first. And Roosevelt um, exuded this sense of confidence. And one of the things that's always shocked me is, you know, we're all familiar with um, the famous line, the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. And that was in his inaugural address. And it always um, shocks and amazes me that, you know, if you read that quote, and you hear that speech in the context of what was going on in the country uh, because of the Great Depression. Um, the unemployment rate was 25% on average, as high as 60% in some places and in some industries. Uh, American uh, National Steel had had um, 200,000 employees in 1929 and had zero in 1932. Um, the suicide rate in the country tripled. Uh, there were about 2 million people uh, riding the rails out there looking for work as hobos, um, people living in Hoovervilles. Uh, banks were closing at 1,000 a day. Farms were going under at 1,000 a day. And so Roosevelt gets up there and he says to the country, we have nothing to fear but fear itself. And what amazes me about that is you can read that either one of two ways. Either this guy is nuts right, with 25% unemployment, suicide rate is tripled, banks and farms going under at a clip of a thousand a day. He tells me I have nothing to fear but fear itself. I've got hunger to fear. I've got starvation. I've got living on the street. I've got not being able to put shoes on my kids' feet. That's what I've got to fear. But Roosevelt meant it in an entirely different way. He meant it to, as, uh, to send a message to people that, don't worry, I've got a plan. Okay, I've got a plan on how to get us through this. And that confidence, that sense of confidence that he was able to exude in those opening minutes of his presidency um, basically vaccinated the country uh, against the, the fear and the terror that had been being felt up to that point. And it gave people a sense of hope. It gave people a sense of purpose. It gave people a sense that somebody's up there that knows what, um, what they're doing. So Roosevelt had a very clear sense of where he wanted to go, and he was a great communicator. Um, you know, Ronald Reagan, you know, will come up later on also as a great communicator. But uh, Roosevelt was sort of the original great communicator with his fireside chats, where he sat people down, talked very plainly, and said, "Here's what we're going to do. Here's what the problem is, 
and here's what I want you to do. And you address people as my friends, you know, and that gave people a sense that they were in on the solutions. So over the course of his 12 years in the presidency, I wanted to show you some political cartoons. So here's one that's talking about the, the, uh, the Hoover train to prosperity, which has been um, sidetracked, sorry, Hoover. Um, and you know, it, the Roosevelt special is coming in, but all these reforms haven't happened yet because of that six month period, um, you know, within uh, November to, uh, to March. So this is how people are anticipating Roosevelt coming in. When it comes time for the second election in 36, uh, you know, he's examining Uncle Sam and Uncle Sam is way in better shape than he was back in 32. So people are, all right, let's give this guy another, another chance here, another term. When it comes to um, the 1940 election, some people are beginning to get a little bit nervous here, right? So he's reorganized the government. He wanted to reorganize the, um, the courts. You know, is he setting himself, himself up as a dictator? And keep in mind that you know this is when people like Mussolini have come to power, people like Hitler have come to power, people like Joe Stalin have come to power in somewhat the same way. So it looked very similar to what might be happening here. And then by the fourth term, he's once again, uh, you know, steering this, this uh, chartering this course and steering the ship of state, you know, toward a, a durable peace after the war. So his popularity kind of ebbed and flowed uh, over the course of um, of his presidency. And um, I think that you know what makes him a great president is that he faced the two major crises of the 20th century, the Great Depression and the Second World War. And we could argue over the next two days, you know, um, whether the programs that he brought in were um, you know, the right thing to do or the wrong thing to do, but he certainly got things done. And um, that's why he's remembered um, you know, in that fashion. One of the greatest things that he did, of course, was to pick Harry Truman to be his vice president in the uh, fourth term, because Harry Truman was exactly the guy we needed to pick up the pieces after Roosevelt died just 83 days into his fourth term. And Harry Truman then uh, picked up those, those pieces and picked up the plans and set the world on that post-war uh, course that Roosevelt had uh, laid the foundation for. And so I turn it over to my good friend and colleague, Mark Adams. Thank you, Jeff, and thank you, Elizabeth, also. Um, and if we get the opportunity over the next three days, we can certainly talk about the connections between both Hoover and Truman, and then FDR and Truman as well. Of course, as Jeff finished up there in the 44 election, Truman is the VP, and is the VP until FDR's death in April of 1945, April 12th. What we're going to look at today, of course, though, is the 1948 election, where Truman gets elected in his own right. So let me share my screen here and... As we've mentioned, we're focusing on personality and character. And let me just get the slideshow up here so you can see this. And what's amazing is to me at the Truman Library where we have, you know, all of our representative uh, presidential libraries have the access to the archives and the presidential records and so on. We do actually have color photographs, which most of our photographs quite honestly are black and white. But uh, whenever we get the opportunity to show a color photograph, I'm always excited to do so. And this photograph to me, as we start to look at um, Truman's character and personality, kind of sums Truman up in one photograph. I mean, obviously you see a lot of presidential candidates holding babies and things like that. Um, but we'll see a, a quote later on of the way Truman campaigned, uh, which was quite unique. Uh, we're going to talk a little about the campaign itself, the strategies and things a little bit more on Thursday, but it's hard not to talk about the whistle stop campaign of Truman's throughout the three days. Today, though, we're going to be focusing more on this idea of celebrity and character and charisma. And what's firstly the most important thing to remember about Truman, even though he's vice president in 1944 and then becomes president in 1945, so he's essentially the incumbent in the 48 election, he's still what, somewhat unknown, certainly compared to Herbert Hoover and certainly compared to FDR, who's been in office for so long. And so there was an attempt by the Democratic Party to kind of reintroduce Truman to the nation during the 1948 election. I'm going to show you a primary source document a little bit later on um, just to illustrate that. 
The other part of this celebrity character charisma that really in, encapsulates Truman is his family. Uh, you all know about the, the whistle stop campaign and then traveling around approximately 30,000 miles during that campaign on the back of the train. But he was often accompanied by his wife, Bess, who's in the photograph on the left here, and his daughter, Margaret, who's in the center of this photo. And they, that family um, picture and that family campaigning really sums up the character of Harry Truman in terms of the campaign strategy, but also they were the, his most trusted people that he took with him. Now, they were not at every campaign stop but certainly they accompanied him when they could and when they were able to. And that's a really unique part of the, the campaign that Truman introduces them on the back of the train when they stop at the different places around the country and they get a huge ovation and applause. And it really um, talks a lot about his character that he really puts them front and center in the campaign. Now, Bess, his wife and Margaret really don't have much of a speaking part other than to say thank you and so forth. But certainly um, they left the speaking to Harry Truman, but just having them with him really uh, came across as this family man, uh, devoted husband, devoted father. And they were known as the three musketeers as kind of how the three of them were collectively known. Um, Margaret was born in 1924. So you can do the math in 1948. She's uh, birthdays in February. So in that campaign in the summer and the fall, uh, she's 24 years of age. Um, so who are the other candidates he's facing? Obviously, Jeff mentioned Thomas Dewey. Um, and you all know about the, the famous Dewey defeats Truman newspaper and so on. I'll show you a copy of that a little bit later on. So here he is uh, meeting Dewey. And really, this photograph's kind of revealing in that they're pretty friendly one another. Um, Truman really does not go on the attack against Dewey, even though Dewey is the front runner and the favorite in all the polls. Uh, instead, and you'll see a political cartoon that reflects some of this a bit later on, Truman attacks the 80th Congress. The Republican Congress is his target and his enemy, so to speak, uh, in terms of his campaign. And his campaign strategy is to really attack the 80th Congress which he nicknames the Do Nothing Congress. And that really gets across as the campaign builds momentum in September and October, as they get closer and closer to the election in November. But this is a picture of the two of them meeting. And in fact, Dewey does just as many miles as Truman. He crisscrosses the country as well, and just does maybe about a thousand miles less. Um, so really close in terms of that. So it's not like Truman's campaign is unique in terms of using the train. Well, I'll say a little bit more about their speeches and the, the, um, the content of their speeches is where things differ. You know, there are a couple of other candidates that come into this that we often forget about, but they're really crucial uh, with what's going on in the world in 1948. And one is the Southern Democrats. Some of you know that in the party convention that summer in July of 1948, the Southern Democrats walk out um, over the civil rights message that's being put forward by Truman and others. And in fact, in the February of that election year, Truman had done a, uh, an address to the joint session of Congress uh, outlining his civil rights plans. And in the summer of 1948, in July, Truman issues an executive order integrating the military uh, for the first time. And so the Southern Democrats actually walk out of the convention and form their own party. Strom Thurmond is the leader candidate there for the Southern Democrats. And with that split in the party, um, many people be begin to believe that there's no way Truman could win because those Southern states seem out of reach as the election approaches. The other is on the left wing side of the party, and it's another former vice president. And this time it's Henry Wallace, who Truman had kind of overturned in the 44 convention, who forms the Progressive Party and is more on the left side of the Democratic Party. So the Democrats are split both on the left with Henry Wallace and on the right with Strom Thurmond, leaving Truman in the center, but certainly very vulnerable. Um, and so uh, you can see why the pollsters 
are beginning to wonder who's going to be left to vote for the Democrats when they've lost both the right wing and the left wing of the party. And that really factors in to the character of the campaign. So a question for you guys to keep you on your toes. I've got a political cartoon here and I'll talk some about it, but I want you to ask the, answer the question in the chat box. What Truman character traits can you see in this cartoon? This is obviously the two campaign trains, Dewey on the right, Truman on the left. And rather than doing the raised hand and a verbal response, if you could just type your responses in the box, that may make things go a little bit quicker. But what character trait can you see from Truman on the back of that, tr on that train? And I'll see if we get any quick responses there. So just type them in there, any character traits that you see. Bully aggressive, give them hell, hardworking, Truman looks in charge and able to lead, determined, direct plain speaking, aggressive, tough, strong, outspoken. Somebody may notices the bow tie. Those are great responses and you can, you can keep typing them. Concerned, you can even see the sweat on his brow, right? And his fist clenched, hitting the back of the train. And even the cartoonist calls it the give him hell special. Determined, somebody wrote. Uh, there's a famous quote that, um, that a lot of people, and we've even got audio of this at the library, where somebody yells from the audience, give him hell, Harry, from the audience as he's talking. And he's, he's, uh, his response is, uh, you know, I'm giving him hell whether they like it or not. I mean, he has multiple responses to that. But um, he's, one of his other responses is, I'm just telling them the truth. They just think it's hell. Quite a number of you say determined. So those are good character traits that he really uses on the trail uh, as he goes around the country. Now it's interesting, when he first started the campaign in the summer, uh, in June, uh, he um, would have prepared speeches. By the time they got to September, he had dumped those and he spoke a lot more off the cuff and a little more impromptu. And that's when his speaking style was better rather than reading from prepared notes. And he had more of this determined, aggressive style. Most of that aggression though, as I mentioned, was aimed not at Dewey, but at the 80th Congress. And you can see that in this one, similar responses. You can answer the same question if you would like. What character traits do you see here? And just to help you, you see Harry Truman's hat on the ground. So Truman is on the left, Dewey is in the middle, and 80th Congress is on the right. And what character traits do you see there? Uh, Dewey is seen as smooth in both, probably both of those cartoons. And we've got one for Dewey next. Um, aggressive is obviously the most one. A fighter willing to confront. So he's got his sleeves rolled up, right? He's charging at the 80th Congress. Dewey seems incompetent, says Diana, I like that. And uh, the 80th Congress is holding on to their hat, ready. Uh, aggressive, going to get things done. Ambition, says Josh. Uh, more like a common man. And I guess he's got that bow tie again as well. And again, the sweat on the brow. So showing that kind of aggression. But it really does point to the fact that Truman's campaign is against the 80th Congress. I've looked at a lot of his speeches that he gives and most of them are about the 80th Congress, not about Dewey. He, he does mention Dewey, don't get me wrong. He doesn't ignore him completely. Um, but this abrasive, strong, aggressive Truman, um, some people accuse him of not being presidential, right? You can see that, how that might come across. He's so aggressive, so abrasive. And on the Dewey side, the Dewey campaign are really pushing for him to respond to Truman, to fight back, which actually Dewey did against FDR, uh, but he didn't do that against Truman. He, he uh, really didn't attack Truman uh, personally, uh, like we might see in, um, in today's campaigns. So Diane mentions he takes his coat off, he's ready to fight, almost like a street fighter, right? He's ready to go. Um, let's change track a little bit. And then here we have one, what, just to look at the opposition. And here we have Dewey, on the right saying, what's the use of going through with the election? And he's looking at all of these 
polls that are saying that Dewey's going to win, right? The Newsweek poll isn't on there, but Newsweek magazine comes out. All 50 pundits on the Newsweek poll um, say that uh, Dewey is going to win. Uh, what character trait would you give for Dewey on this one as a contrast, as we look at this political cartoon where he's got his hands on his lapels and he's saying, what's the use of going through with the election? Uh, confident and smug, a patronizing, confident and cocky, slick. You guys are amazing, by the way. I'm going to give you a, a kudos, super confident. So very quickly, just using a couple of political cartoons, you get the sense of the character of both of the lead candidates. And Dewey really was uh, accused of running a smug campaign. Uh, in terms of his speeches, he gave the same stump speech over and over and over again, whereas Truman uh, tailored his speech uh, for the particular audience that he faced. And all of these cartoons are available to you uh, from our resources that we're going to share with you a little bit later on. Uh, interesting at the, the bottom, Little White Lies uh, resembles fake news, absolutely. So you can use that to compare to today. And of course, when we see the results of the election, you'll know that these pollsters were all incorrect. So Truman's character, one of the things that he did on the campaign was to remind people where he came from. As we talked about at the beginning, people didn't necessarily know who Truman was. He was a farmer and these photos are all from our archives. We have about 100,000 photographs and about 60,000 of those photographs are digitized and available online. So the photo on the top left is Truman farming in 1910. The photo on the bottom is Truman as a businessman in 1920. And what does he do in between? He's a captain in World War I, and he's the only president uh, to see combat in World War I in France. And this photograph is taken in France in 1918. And he's in the uh, 35th Division, 129th Field Artillery. And of course, he knew how to ride a horse already. He's promoted to captain. And of course, those uh, war veterans help him when he goes into politics later on. By the time he comes to the, the late 20s, he's a county commissioner for Jackson County, Missouri, where Independence is located. And then by the 30s, for 10 years, he serves as the U.S. Senator for Missouri before it becomes um, president, vice president and then president. He's so unknown that during the 1948 election campaign, the Democratic Party puts out this comic book, which is digitized and you can see the whole thing online on our website and we've got a link to it in our resources for you. And the first line of this comic book is what I want to draw attention to. And that is farm boy, soldier, statesman, president. And so immediately they're reminding people uh, of Herbie's background, that he was a farmer, that he was a soldier, that he was a politician, both county commissioner and a senator. Uh, and of course, he's the sitting president. We've got a couple of questions and I'm going to address those. Uh, they asked about his KKK membership. Was that a campaign issue? It really wasn't. He had denounced that in the 20s. That was used against him in the county commission and Senate races. He actually rejected that membership um, because of their anti-Catholicism. And so he'd really addressed that issue running for the Senate in 1934. Um, and then this whole comic book is online. It's about 16 pages and it goes through his whole life. But of course, there's quite a large feature about his time as a captain in World War I. And then just to finish up, one of his aides is Clark Clifford. Um, and he really uses this quote, which is a great one. He talks about Truman being a good politician, but he talks about his courage. All those pollsters saying that he was going to lose. And really many times, even from his wife, Bess, she had given up. She thought he was going to lose. He was the only one that really thought he was going to win in that campaign. It was a very grueling campaign, as I mentioned, and we're going to get in to more detail of that in the next few days. But you can read this quote. Uh, the last sentence is the one I like. It wasn't Harry Truman, the politician at one. It was Harry Truman, the man. So we're going to uh, stop the sharing there. And um, looking at my chronology, 
we're going to skip forward from the 40s all the way to Mira in 1980. So, and we will continue to take questions in the, in the chat box as we go on. But let's hear from Mira Cohen and the Reagan campaign of 1980. All right, uh, thank you so much. I'm actually gonna talk more about uh, 1980 tomorrow. I'm gonna focus a lot on 1984 today. Um, the theme for today is personality as it relates to winning campaigns because all of us are here to talk about campaigns that won. And uh, the subcategories are celebrity, character, and charisma. And I think those three adjectives really say a lot and speak a lot to Ronald Reagan and his ability to capture hearts and minds. Of course, we all know that he had been a radio star, a television star, a movie star, um, and Leslie had pointed out earlier in looking at the campaign buttons that she thought President, or she, I think it's a she, that they thought, uh, President Reagan had a terrific smile and he was um, known also for that winning smile. So, um, not only did he like to smile, he made other people like to smile and like to laugh. He used his humor oftentimes to disarm critics, those who said he was too militaristic, um, complained about his economic programs, and uh, even worried about his age. At that point in time, it's sort of funny to put in the context of today's election, but there was a lot of concern around his age. In 1984 at 73, he was the oldest sitting president. And of course, he was also running against Walter Mondale, who was in his 50s. So at a very famous debate. Uh, here's how that played out. Give me just a second. Go. Mr. President, I want to raise an issue that I think has been lurking out there for two or three weeks and cast it specifically in national security terms. You already are the oldest president in history, and some of your staff say you were tired after your most recent encounter with Mr. Mr. Uh, Mondale. Um, I recall yet that President Kennedy had to go for days on end with very little sleep during the Cuba Missile Crisis. Is there any doubt in your mind? that you would be able to function in such circumstances? Not at all, Mr. Truitt, and I, and I want you to know that also, I will not make age an issue of this campaign. I am not going to exploit for political purposes my opponent's youth and inexperience. <laughs> I still have time, I might add, Mr. Drew. Okay, so um, with humor, uh, the issue of President Reagan's age was by and large put to rest. It did not come up, uh, to, at least to the same extent that it had prior. So humor was very much a tool and part of President Reagan's charisma and his celebrity. He used it quite often. Um, he was funny, and uh, he, made, he made people laugh. He put them at ease. Now, President Reagan was very much a storyteller. This was another aspect of his personality and his charisma, his storytelling. Um, he was known sometimes to embellish, but he often connected very much with um, regular, everyday folks and really loved to tell not only his own stories, but their stories. So we're gonna take a look right now. One of my favorite stories, which was actually occurring while Reagan was president in 1984, but of course he's running for his second term. So I know uh, Kathleen's gonna talk a little bit later as well. It's kind of a funny thing, uh, cause you're really not supposed to use the office of the presidency and official events to campaign. Uh, but um, it is, of course, the most famous bully pulpit, and it is an opportunity 
to show off your chops and your skills as president. So in 1984, we're looking at the 60th anniversary of um, D-Day. And President Reagan planned a series of speeches in France at Normandy to commemorate the 40th, uh, excuse me, the 60th anniversary of um, Normandy. And it was quite remarkable because in those days, CNN was brand new. We didn't have the multiple ongoing 24 hour news cycles. Most Americans were still getting their news um, in the morning from your standard networks, ABC, CBS, and um, ABC, CBS, NBC, and in the evening. So these speeches were literally timed to coincide with the programming that you would see in the United States, even though these events were taking place in Europe. So to discuss his special ability to create relationships with regular everyday Americans, I want to focus on a letter I was a flight attendant at the time, uh, and a mom and a daughter uh, and a wife sent to President Reagan, and she asked to um, attend, excuse me, I keep saying the 60th, the 40th Memorial of D-Day, and she asked, I, we had an event for the 60s, so I want to talk a little bit about that later, the 40th anniversary of uh, D-Day, she tells a story about her father, uh, Private Zanata Han, and she asked to be part of the official delegation, which is highly unusual uh, to ask. It's highly unusual to include um, an everyday American in a, a grand international delegation. And here's her letter, letter March 15, 1984, to President Reagan. And not only does the letter get picked up, but Lisa's story about her father, we're gonna watch in just a moment, becomes incorporated into the story of the event, of the day, of the experience. And President Reagan connects to such an emotional extent. So what's happening is you have this made for television commemorative speech where the camera, and you'll see it in a minute, flashes to Lisa herself, her family, her husband, her mother, and President Reagan becomes choked up as he's telling this story. Um, this story becomes the everyman story that really, in fact, makes the speech. And it's not just the story, but it's how President Reagan shares it and it's his relationship with Lisa Zanata Hen. Lisa Zanata Hen came out to the Reagan Library in 2006 uh, to speak at a Veterans Day ceremony. And she talked about and she described her relationship with President Reagan. And I think this summarizes so much about the president's character and charisma and how so many people found themselves relating and connecting with President Reagan on a human level, even when they truly did not agree with his policies. He was very well liked. So here's what she said. President Reagan's reaction to my story, not only including me in his envoy, but sharing my father's story, was testimony to the kind of person that he was, so accessible, so personable, the first time I met President Reagan, I was so nervous. I kept thinking to myself, please don't trip. But the minute the president, I saw the president, all my fears melted away. Lisa, he said, your father would be very proud of you. And it was like being with my own father who had wished so much to return to Normandy to pay his respects to those who did not return. So with that, let's take a moment and let's watch the speech 
and the interaction. She ended with a promise to her father, who died eight years ago of cancer. I'm going there, Dad. And I'll see the beaches and the barricades and the monuments. I'll see the graves and I'll put flowers there just like you wanted to do. I'll feel all the things you made me feel through your stories and your eyes. I'll never forget what you went through, Dad. Nor will I let anyone else forget. And Dad, I'll always be proud. Through the words of his loving daughter, who is here with us today, a D-Day veteran has shown us the meaning of this day far better than any president can. It is enough for us to say about Private Zanetta and all the men of honor and courage who fought beside him four decades ago, we will always remember. We will always be proud. We will always be prepared so we may be always free. Yeah. Okay, uh, with that, I pass on over to Kathleen from the Clinton and more tomorrow. All right, so I believe I am now sharing my screen and I will start this from the beginning. Um, so just a uh, fair warning, I have an annoying adoration of alliteration. Um, so there will be a lot of alliteration in this presentation, but I find it keeps me on my toes. Why am I not? There we go. All right, so in thinking about personality and thinking about President Clinton, um, there's something that comes to mind. President Clinton has several nicknames, uh, but my favorite is the comeback kid. And this is something that builds throughout his life. So I kind of wanted to look at, um, well, some of the things that he has come back from and how he has turned them into advantages, uh, both in his life and in his presidential campaigns. All right, so here we have Billy the Kid. Um, and we're looking at, on the left-hand side of the screen, we're looking at uh, President Clinton's maternal grandparents your screen is not sharing it's not it's not well, all Sorry right to interrupt. i just wanted to let you know <laughs> there we go all right yes, now we can see it now you can see it awesome yes. we will start from the beginning because you must must see these adorable photos all right so uh, President Clinton born in a small town in Arkansas, not super small, and uh, they did have hot and cold running water. He was born in a hospital, not in a log cabin. Um, his father died before he was born, and his mother, a, a very young widow, um, lived with her parents and then went back to school in New Orleans. She studied to be a nurse anesthetist which is a really hard word for me to say. Um, but, and I think, Elizabeth, you said this earlier about, about Hoover. So that kind of rags to riches um, or, you know, rise to, rise from humble beginnings. Uh, so we know that President Clinton uh, is, was raised in part by his widowed mother, but then also she went back to school so raised in part by his maternal grandparents. You see pictures of them here. So if you've ever seen the Clinton birthplace, it's a National Historic Site run by the National Park Service. It's not a small house, um, but then to learn that um, Eldridge, that was his maternal grandfather, Eldridge uh, worked two jobs. He owned a store and it's significant uh, that he owned the store because he extended credit 
to African-Americans, which was not always the case in the South. And then that is his mother, um, well, Virginia's mother, uh, Edith Cassidy, there leaning against that brick wall underneath that window. So a nurse, a traditionally, you know, traditional, traditional female um, occupation. And Virginia, quite the striking figure there, holding a little Boston Terrier in front of their house. And President Clinton, for some reason, wearing a giant suit um, in front of a lovely car. And then on the other side of the screen, you see Roger Clinton, the man who would become uh, Virginia's second husband. She actually married him twice. Um, they were married, uh, got divorced from President Clinton was a teenager, and then uh, Virginia Kelly felt sorry for Clinton, uh, for Roger Clinton, um, and remarried him. Um, but you see, um, little Billy Clinton had a, a great childhood. Um, I will say it's well known, and this is, these are President Clinton's uh, words and not mine. Um, stepfather Roger Clinton was an abusive alcoholic. So President Clinton takes these things, takes these challenges, and he comes back from them, right? He's born in a small town. He uses that, um, you know, in speeches during his first campaign. I still believe in a place called Hope. Uh, you know, incredibly lucky that he wasn't born in, you know, dire straits, Arkansas, there's no such place. Um, but really kind of um, appealing to the middle class, kind of placing himself there. Um, and President Clinton developed, developed um, a skill set. Um, he has an incredible memory, but then also, so that's a, um, something I assume he was born with, but because he moves frequently, um, he's in hope for the first six years of his life in between first and second grade. Um, they moved to Hot Springs, but he's at three, four different schools before he graduates from high school. Um, so he uses that. He uses that, the memory to connect to people, to be able to recall their stories, uh, to remember them. And he also plays on this, uh, that his life story exemplifies the American ideal that anyone can grow up to be president. So President Clinton is political from an early age, but he is also, he also faces challenges. He is um, successful in um, attending uh, Boys State and then representing Arkansas Boys Nation. And it's my understanding that he elbows his way up to be right in the spot to shake hands with John F. Kennedy, one of his heroes. And then he goes away to school, he goes to Georgetown, gets a law degree at Yale, comes back to Arkansas and, well, he doesn't get elected to, um, to the Senate, he runs. Um, and you see early losses, um, adult losses. Let me get you to the next slide. Yes, he could have been his middle, middle school valedictorian. Um, he was dropped to third because of his deportment grade, which would be behavior. Um, he could have been his high school class president. He was not, he was beaten by a female classmate. He was class president at Georgetown his sophomore and junior year, but was not reelected senior year because his um, classmates deemed him too political. Um, he was unsuccessful. I said Senate, but I meant House. Unsuccessful run in 1974 um, for the third congressional district representing Arkansas, but then bounces right back. So it's two years later, he's elected Arkansas's attorney general, youngest, Arkansas, youngest attorney general in Arkansas history. And then in 1980, he, I'm sorry, 1978, he becomes the nation's, nation's youngest governor. But then two years later, so at the time there were two year terms, he is booted out of office. And we have an, um, a great orientation film where President Clinton is speaking 
of this time and that he really tried to do too many things too fast and didn't listen to his constituents. All right. So regardless of what you know about President Clinton or how you feel about President Clinton, boring is not normally a word that you hear associated with him. Um, he is incredibly charismatic. He uh, gives speeches in a way that he can make you feel like he's talking to you. Um, this was not the case in 1988. Michael Dukakis was running against, um, oh, George H.W. Bush, Michael Dukakis. So, um, so Reagan's vice president, George H.W. Bush, is, is campaigning to step into the presidency, and Michael Dukakis is the, the Democratic challenger, and President Clinton at this time is the governor of Arkansas, and he's kind of risen through the ranks in some national level organizations, including being the head of the National Governors Association. And he is invited to introduce Michael Dukakis. And there are some issues with the, um, the timing of this announcement. And then President Clinton uh, does not read the crowd and does not realize that they're ready to go. And he gives an incredibly long, boring, uh, terrible, terrible speech. And he recovers from that, again, circling back to the idea of comeback kid, is that he goes on The Tonight Show. He not only allows Johnny Carson to make fun of him, but he makes fun of himself. Um, there were many, many political pundits who said, I don't know who that guy is, but he needs to go back from whatever that state he came from and just do whatever he does there because he will never make it on a national stage. So this kind of gives you some background about the things I just said. Um, his um, getting booted after his first two year term comes in part. Um, he does a lot of unpopular things. He raises the price um, for car registration, so what it costs to get tags for your vehicle. He tells every Arkansas teacher, regardless of how long they've been teaching, that they will have to take a test to prove that they can teach the subject that they're teaching. And then, um, largely unwillingly, um, Governor Clinton is forced to accept, by, by President Carter, forced to accept um, Cuban refugees. They are brought into Fort Chaffee, which is the, the west side of Arkansas, and it is it does not go well. It does not go well. And then last but not least, um, there's some speculation that part of the reason he was not reelected as governor initially is that he had a wife who was a lawyer and she kept her maiden name and she didn't wear a lot of makeup and she wore really thick glasses and she had a lot of opinions. Uh, there is something Southerners, I can say this because I'm from Georgia, um, Southerners don't always like it when people from the North or Northeast in particular come down and tell us how to better ourselves. Um, of course, Hillary Clinton was suggesting things like uh, childhood immunizations and early uh, literacy programs. But nonetheless, um, she did not fit in well in Arkansas. But you can see on the flip side, President Clinton comes back from that 1980 defeat and he's elected time and time again. Initially, those terms are two-year terms, so that's why it's so frequent. Um, but then he is elected for a four-year term in the 1990, 1990 election, which means he should have served um, until 1992. But as we know, he decides to run for president. So I want to point out something that is not that different from my colleagues, but very different from modern 
presidential campaigns, and that is that President Clinton announces he's seeking the office of president a year and a month, so 13 months before the election. So the election is November 1992, um, which now, you know, people are announcing the day after the presidential election that they're running in the next one. So presidential campaigns were a little shorter um, and we see them, so we see a lot of challenges. President Clinton announces he is relatively unknown. Um, George H.W. Bush is expected to win. Um, I'm gonna talk about some economic and, and environmental factors tomorrow. Um, and Clinton does not do well in the first set of, of primaries. And I know that, that Iowa is a caucus He's a distant third. He's a respectable second in New Hampshire, respectable third in Maine and South Dakota, but it's not looking that great. Uh, President Clinton has a secret weapon. President Clinton has a group of Arkansas travelers. And if you, I don't think I want to tell you the story of Arkansas travelers right now, um, but it is, it's a, it's a, a positive term. And in the case these friends of President Clinton's um, paid their own way and went places like New Hampshire and Iowa and knocked on doors, uh, which is crazy to think that people now, you wouldn't answer your door, you wouldn't answer your phone, uh, but they knocked on doors in neighborhoods and said, hey, let me, let me tell you about my governor. Ask me about my governor. Let me tell you about the things he's done in Arkansas. So we see in March, Super Tuesday, President Clinton gets his first win in Georgia. He's got a strong majority. And then four days later, he's in South Carolina. And this is significant because we're showing a Democrat winning in the South. There are one of those challenges that keeps popping up um, during the primaries is alleged affairs. Hillary Clinton goes on television with President Clinton. They have a, a lengthy interview on 60 Minutes, um, which she says some things um, that help him, but she also says some things uh, that were negative, uh, suggesting that she was not like Tammy Wynette, that she would not stand by her man. Um, and it's not on the 60 Minutes interview, but she does speak uh, at some point about uh, pushback on her career and she is completely unapologetic and says, well, I guess I could have stayed home and baked cookies. Uh, she is forced to, pun intended, eat her words and her chocolate chip cookie recipe gets published in Family Circle. So President Clinton selects Al Gore as his running mate and it's very, very strategic, right? You might think that he would have gone with someone, you know, Arkansas and Tennessee, if you know your geography, they're, they abut at the Mississippi River, both Southern states, but Gore brought some things to the table that Clinton was lacking, specifically. Clinton was dinged for having limited foreign policy experience. What does he know about being a diplomat, he is the governor of Arkansas. Gore brings to the table 15 years in Congress. He's a representative and then a senator from the state of Tennessee. Clinton um, did his undergrad at Georgetown. His law degree is from Yale. So there's some thought that Clinton and Democrats in general, that he's gonna pick someone from the Northeast, that he's really gonna go um, well, the liberal elite. And to fight that, and Gore's education is no slouch either, his undergraduate is from Harvard, but his law degree is from Vanderbilt, and picking someone who represents a Southern state kind of bolsters that idea that this campaign is about average people. It's not, you know, people like to say, well, we're not New York, no offense, Jeff, we're not New York City, we're not those people, we're not those tax and spend uh, traditional Democrats. And so Gore helps bolster that. 
Clinton. Clinton had to answer a lot of questions during his initial campaign about his avoidance of the Vietnam War. And if you read his autobiography, it was active avoidance, right? It was very purposeful. He um, kind of played two scenarios against one another to kind of to increase his chances of not going to Vietnam. Um, Al Gore was not drafted. He actually enlisted in the army in August of 1969 um, and served in Vietnam. So that kind of counterbalanced uh, that challenge for President Clinton. And then I've mentioned a couple of things about Hillary Clinton being a less traditional uh, politician's wife and Gore brought his lovely wife, Tipper, their four beautiful children, Tipper Gore, known, um, known most in my mind for her work to get um, adult content either removed or labeled. She formed the Parents Music Resource Council. I think the C is for council. Um, so, so again, kind of counterbalancing. So what we see here is we see someone who's very charismatic, but has significant challenges and finds a way to make those challenges into comebacks. So I'm pretty sure that is my last slide. I will stop sharing the screen and we can have some discussion about all of the exciting things we've seen today. Thank you so much, Kathleen. So what we wanted to do now is to ask you, we've thrown a lot at you and you're all gonna have access to all of those documents, the videos, the content, the wonderful cartoons that have been shared. Um, if you could just brainstorm in the chat box a minute and think about how you might integrate some of what you heard about and saw today into your courses. Let us know what you teach, if it's US history, if it's government, if it's world history, if it's English, if it's calculus, whatever it is, let us know what you teach and how you might integrate it just a moment in the chat box. Not lose um, <laughs> common sense and you're moving it greater, okay. Uh, U.S. history, we, okay, great. American Revolution. That's interesting, Monica. So how might uh, you use this in revolution or reconstruction? Because we're all looking at some modern things. AP government, modern, modern campaigns. Sure, that sounds like a good fit. Cartoons and video, great. AP government, civics U.S. Called to the presidency versus modern campaigning. That's that's really interesting, Monica. Um, I wonder if you could elaborate a little bit in the chat box what you mean by the difference, what called to the presidency versus modern campaigning, what you might use to illustrate that point. Yeah. Cartoons, great. Again, you will have access to those, so that's terrific. Oh, building candidates. That's very interesting. Um, oh, so so know a lot about, okay. Cult of personality integrated in campaigns. Sure, sure. Um, I, I loved how Kathleen talked about the uh, Bill Clinton. We called himself the comeback kid. Um, cult of personality, certainly have that with all of our presidents. Not sure I'd necessarily cult, but certainly um, exaggeration almost of some charismatic personalities. Yeah, wonderful. Um, okay, thank you all. Um, let me ask you now, do you have any questions for the group? Yeah, um, and is there anything uh, you'd really like to see over the next few days? Uh, that you'd like to just something special that you're looking for that you'd like to give us a heads up about um, so that maybe we can uh, make sure we're needing meeting uh, those needs and interests. Anything special you want to hear a little bit more about because we got a couple more days together. Yeah, 
Amir, I want to take this question. Someone said sure. they're curious to see how campaign qualities came to play during the presidencies. Mm -hmm. um, I can tell you from spending a lot of time in Hoover's archives, a lot of the people that is, like identified with Hoover, especially engineers, would write to Hoover like with their engineering letterheads and say, I'm an engineer like you. I've looked at the economy like an engineer, and this is how you should solve it. And they really felt like they had some kind of access to Hoover because they were engineers like he was. Um, and it was, sometimes they wrote like in a very personal tone. And I have to go back and look because I was curious if Hoover actually knew these people. And his secretaries would respond and say, you know, Hoover knows what's going on. We're working on it. Um, thank you for the, the advice. It's kind of interesting to me to think now that people got personal responses. But people really felt like they were connected to the president through those things that they campaigned on, like being an engineer. And I'm sure we've seen that in other presidencies as well, but I've never seen it illustrated as clearly as when I've been in Hoover's, you know, personal papers. Yeah, that's great. Um, someone asked about changes as of today. I'm, I'm not sure it could, it, if uh, TCL, if you could um, explain what you mean by that. What kinds of changes? Changes in campaign laws. Changes in a little bit confused as that. You while, know, they, you know, while they uh, respond to that, um, let me respond to the FDR question. It was in uh, the he mentions the New Deal. Uh, in the second to last paragraph of his acceptance speech um, at the at the convention, and again, he's just he's just throwing it out as a term, and um, it's almost as if the, you know, the second to last paragraph, you know, the press kind of wakes up, hears that, writes it down, and we now know it as the New Deal. Great. Um, current events happening during campaigns. Yeah, we're going to talk a lot tomorrow about how current events have affected each of our president's campaigns, absolutely, playing a major role. Utilization of different media to cover the campaign message, yep, uh, that's, that's Thursday, we got that covered, terrific. Um, interactive selection of the president's daily plan. Okay, very nice. Um, that's terrific stuff. Uh, do you mean the can? I think you mean what the day in the campaign might look like. Um, that's a good question. Um, context of the times. Yeah, that was very interesting. I agree with Hoover. Um, comparing president elections to this upcoming elections. That's a really good point. We're not, we work for the federal government, so we gotta be really careful in terms of politics, but we are gonna throw it out to you and present some thoughts and ideas uh, related to uh, differences in campaigns. And uh, I think you're gonna find at the end of the week, um, while each of these campaigns has had differences around personality, different issues coming up in current events and different media that are being used, um, you know, these change over time. And certainly with media, uh, different presidents are using media in different ways. And based on technology, which we're gonna talk more about Wednesday, you have different access to different media. So for the first time, we're looking at a president uh, today who's making extensive use in his current campaign, as well as the candidates uh, of social media. And that's something none of the presidents that we're talking about uh, really had the either opportunity or challenge to work with, of course. So technology, we're gonna talk a lot about how technology can influence campaigns and campaign strategy. Attack ads, yeah, that's an excellent question. Um, we, can, we, we will be addressing that as well, I love it. I love that you're telling us uh, what you're looking for. I think that's super helpful as we plan the next few days. Um, Sarah, can I interrupt you for a second? Absolutely. I'm gonna share a Google Doc in the chat with everybody, a Google folder, and that has links to all of the 
sources that we're using. It's dynamic, so we're going to update it every day. There's also a spreadsheet in there for you guys to share your information with each other, which is something we normally do at teachers workshops, but obviously times are different. Um, so it'll give you some space to look at that and enter your own information if you want to share it. So yeah. I'm going to put that in the chat right now for you guys, and I will keep adding it every day. Um, and I'm going to add my presentations every day as they go through too. I'm definitely going to talk about attack ads because that was kind of the cornerstone of the strategy for Hoover's campaign. And I'm, I'm sure other people will talk about it um, as well as we move on. But yeah, that's, I just wanted to put that in there and, and get that out there. And to make sure that you guys stay on for the survey at the end that Teresa is going to send, because it will give you the option to get certificates for your PD hours so you can submit them to your districts. Yeah, let's go ahead, Therese, and send that out now just in the last five minutes so you don't have to go over time. You can just quickly fill out the survey. Um, and while Therese is putting that up there, I want to say thank you all for attending. It's nice to be able to get together um, even virtually. And we look forward to seeing you all tomorrow. So is everybody getting the survey? Survey, survey? Great. All right. Well, I think we're going to go ahead now and sign off. Please remember to take the rest next couple minutes and complete the survey. And we are very much looking forward to seeing you tomorrow. And if you have, there's still space. If you have some colleagues, some friends that want to join in, please encourage them. Uh, we'd love to share with as many people as possible. Enjoy the rest of your Tuesday. Bye-bye.